welcome to Nerd Stalker. I am Adolfo Franda at Nerd Stalker on Twitter, and you are Greg Gloria, aka Social Greg on Twitter. Welcome. Happy post Mother's Day week thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, happy, happy, happy day to all. <laughs> and uh, as usual, just want to remind everyone we do have a Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Nerd Stalker. We appreciate any support that you can afford in this time. Also click our PayPal support uh, link on our blog post at nerdstalker.com. And uh, off to the races, huh? Yeah, let's do it, man. The office is dead. Oh, we've been talking about I this love for this. a while. Yeah, let's yeah, talk I about this now. <laughs> okay, man. So yeah, in uh, early March, a gentleman named Jeff Haney, the CEO of Austin-based software company Pinpoint was gearing up to find new office space. Pinpoint's $25,000 per month lease with WeWork for 1,800 square feet would be up in August, and it was time to move on. He was thinking he'd need maybe 10,000 square feet for his growing company, which makes software for programmers. Then the pandemic hit, and along with it, the enforced work from home orders, and Haney began questioning his figures. A survey he conducted a month and revealed that roughly half of the company's 27 Austin employees would be perfectly happy with continuing working from home. Maybe Pinpoint could get by with 3,000 or 5,000 square feet, less, th less than half the amount of space he thought he'd need for going desks for basically a conference room and a little collaborative working space. And maybe, given that fewer employees might need to commute regularly during rush hour, it could be in a, the neighborhood far cheaper than the domain, the hot tech cluster where Facebook and Amazon also have offices. It's not something I was even thinking about six weeks ago, but it's definitely something I've been talking about with my investors, Haney says. Overall, it's a win-win. This is just the tip of the iceberg from startups and tech giants to more old school Wall Street firms. Businesses are rethinking the role of the office space and whether they even need it. If in the old world, an office was a form of corporate peacocking, a flashy location in some iconic building with a boutique hotel level of design for clients, employees, customers, and investors, in the new world, it's becoming a costly line item that could be reduced to the equivalent of a single flagship store. Instead of sprawling, capital-intensive, real-world footprint, all the world can be done virtually with one scaled down sim symbolic home base left for critical face-to-face -face conversations like meeting with clients or wooing talent. It's something no one could have foreseen three months ago. After a decade of economic expansion, commercial rents have risen to an average of nearly $30 per square foot or 3.4% over the last year, according to an April report. Many companies have had an aversion to remote work. IBM, for one, canceled work from home in 2017, and few had the technology or infrastructure to make it work seamlessly. IBM was hardly alone. At the outset of the crisis, remote work evangelist and base camp co-founder David Heinemeyer Hansen Twitter shamed dozens of companies, including Accenture, AT&T, Cognizant, Epic Systems, Tesla, SpaceX, and Wells Fargo, for dragging their heels and allowing employees to work from home. Now, more than two months in, the mass work from home experiment has forced many businesses out of their comfort zone, pushing them to make the necessary small investments in virtual infrastructure. Even typically staid financial firms like Morgan Stanley and Barclays have adapted, finding solutions to security hurdles that previously prevented a distributed workforce. Many of these companies are realizing that it is not only less scary than they imagine, but their employees are actually more productive. One analysis of server activity found that workers are putting in longer work days. Imagine what kind of productivity boost might look like when the kids finally go back to school. Now, staring down the barrel of a recession, companies are shifting into cost-cutting survival mode, and a huge fixed cost of office space will, for many, be the first on the chopping block. A study by Squarefoot, which specializes in helping businesses find space, found that companies in New York City spend an average of $17,000 per employee annually on office space. As companies fight to survive, that's an awful lot of cash to burn on something like that, it turns out, can be replaced by space in employees' homes. Many commercial leases, which are often 10 years, require companies to foot the bill for unusable space, such as columns and structural elements, as well as portion of shared areas, such as the lobby, bathrooms, and elevators. Among other things, a 10-year lease helps lock in prices, something desirable in economic expansion, but a potential chokehold now. 
And so comes the office space exodus. Since the pandemic, Google's parent company Alphabet has pulled out of deals to acquire more than 2 million square feet of office space, including what would have been the biggest real estate deal in the Bay Area. According to the information, James Gorman, the CEO of Morgan Stanley, recently told Bloomberg that the company has proven it can operate with effectively no footprint and will have much less real estate in the future. Insurer and financial services provider Nationwide announced plans to close five offices permanently, transitioning those employees to working from home. We've been investing in our technological capabilities for years, and those investments really paid off when we needed, the tra we needed to transition to a 98% work from home model, CEO Kirk Walker said in the company statement. Groupon, which recently laid off or furloughed roughly 44% of its workforce, is continuing to sublease 150,000 square feet in its Riverside headquarters, says the Chicago Tribune. And on Friday, real estate development startup Cul-de-Sac announced it would be giving up its San Francisco headquarters. Remote work is working great for us, tweeted co-founder Ryan Johnson. Meanwhile, Roy Abernathy, head of Global Corporate Services Workplace Strategies at commercial broker Newmark Knight Frank, has started getting requests from clients reevaluating their current situation. I was just on a call with, where the CFO said, I want you to go back to the landlord and shed 25% of our space. As we settle into the idea that things might not return to normal until 2022, cities are already starting to lose their, lose their sheen. Workers pay a premium to live there, but with the end of the pandemic nowhere in sight and the newfound ability to work from anywhere, talent is already antsy. It won't be long before cities, most talented workers flee high priced cities for more spacious, affordable spaces elsewhere in the country. And no rents for office space in big cities, once prized for their density of talent and mass transit options, and now struggling to adapt in the age of social distancing, could begin to plummet. There isn't enough data yet to determine exactly how much office rents might decline, and it will vary considerably by market. So far, there hasn't been a noticeable fall in prices, even in expensive markets hit hard by the coronavirus. Prices remained steady in New York City and even rose slightly in downtown San Francisco. That's likely because rents are historically slow to respond to economic downturns. In the past three recessions, it took about a year after the recession's peak before real estate costs reflected those downturns. Real estate costs are driven by supply and demand, and where there's a lot of vacancy, landlords get more flexible and drop the rents because they need a tenant. But right now, vacancies are really low, and they will be until we sort of get through what we're going through in the next six months. And then we're going to see a lot of space for sublease, and that will throw a wrench in the supply chain and force landlords to draw prices. It also may be several years before the dust settles because so many companies have long leases. Groupons, for example, is through January of 2026. This may also put an end to our love affair with the almost 150-year-old concept of the skyscraper. Now, it's hard to imagine wanting to cram into an elevator to get up to these spaces. As was the case in 9-11, lower floors may temporarily command higher rents than the skyscraping ones post-pandemic, in part because of logistics required to keep too many people from sharing the same elevator air. The likely shakeup could have far-reaching consequences because commercial real estate has long been beloved by big pension funds and people looking for reliable income. Two groups that will see some of their money evaporate. The industry has historically been so stable that 15% or even 5% of tenants thinking about space differently could really destabilize the market. Rethinking Real Estate's Poleg says, Office tenants will want and will likely get more flexibility and more service, which is less about offering kombucha and pool tables and more about landlords accounting for companies changing needs. This would be in stark contrast to the existing dynamic in which companies have little ne negotiating power between leases. The Newmark Knight Frank report notes that building owners may choose to use concessions as the main vehicle for meeting tenants' demands and overall occupancy costs rather than reducing asking rents. With record unemployment, unprecedented economic crisis, and a remote work awakening, those in the $2.5 trillion office space market should be panicking. But few are ready to succumb to the idea just yet, at least publicly. Oh my God, is what I'm going to say. I mean,
<laughs> I, I, I just you saw that thing on Twitter. I mean, about about Twitter, about you know they could work for him forever, right? I mean, so yeah, that, that, that's a yeah, simple. just yeah, you're right. Yeah, Twitter is saying, as you Greg just mentioned, that they're going to allow their employees to work remotely indefinitely. Yeah, and I think I think this is a trend of many companies to come. We've been talking about this now for a couple of weeks, sort of this yeah. trend. Yeah, um, and obviously with the pandemic, really everyone's talking about remote work now. Yeah, and the one the one thing that I'm a little bit worried about, and you mentioned that in the tagline about the commercial real estate uh, collapse, right, is that a lot of pension funds actually invest in these real estate uh, towers. So this is an interesting. A, a convoluted mess that we're into yeah. economically, you know, uh, and I don't know, you know, if this is also going to push us more out of a recession into a depression because if if there's if there's like these pension funds who are now have like maybe fifteen, I think the average was like fifteen percent invested in real estate mm. um, and commercial real estate. Mm-hmm. Uh, this could be a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a yeah. You are one hundred percent. Oh my correct. god! But but I mean, working from home just was kind of like I mean that's why you see like you know I guess SoftBank must pull out of their WeWork deals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they saw the writing on the wall for that one. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. Like, so. yeah. I mean, the tentacles spread all over the place as you sort of insinuated there. Uh, as the ramifications from this, hopefully, you know, to every yin, there's the yang type of thing. So maybe, maybe this will increase uh, economies of uh, smaller towns, like smaller restaurants and mom and pop restaurants in small towns or whatever, since people will be living in their suburbs, in their, you know, whatever their towns outside of the major cities or whatever. Um, if that trend generally does stick, you know. Yeah. And accounting wise, remember, you could like uh, write off um, home offices and stuff like that. But what if you're working for another person and you're using part of your home for an office? Like, how does that work now? I don't, I, you know. Yeah, totally. Ooh, ooh. All, to right, all, right. all right, all right. So Let's next story, on. Greg, how, yes. do, how to keep remote employees on task. Oh, thank That's you. That's fine. Yes, yes. Well, remember we talked about it last week, right? And it kind of hit me that, that uh, thanks to uh, Inc. and uh, Susan Lucas, also known as the real evil HR lady. <laughs> I thought I love her <laughs> Twitter handle. Um, she said, these are really the two things that ensure remote workers are in fact working is to assess their performance and that's it. You know, and I, I just love that. And, and I want to ask you after this, after I kind of introduced this story about the agile best practices when it comes to teams and stuff like that, because you're really into the agile side too. Um, you know, basically, um, so what is a manager to do? She goes into her article. How can you know if employees are working if you don't use these high-tech methods, as we talked about last week, to monitor them? Well, it's not as hard as you think. Here's the two items. All non-exempt employees need to track their hours, no exception. And looking at the resulting work product from your employees is how you track. <laughs> That's it, the two things. And I, I was just kind of like... Um, you know, it's, it is that simple, but I wanted to ask you about, uh, we kind of went into it last week about agile, agile practices for work teams. And, and a lot of it has to do on the mm-hmm. motivation of these teams to kind of excel, right? And can you talk a little bit more about that from your experience? Yeah, so it's really simple. The Agile Manifesto, I can just read it to you. It's like four, yeah. four lines or, or, you know, sure. or more, or that's it. Sure. So the one tenet is individuals and interactions over processes and tools, right? The second tenet is working software over comprehensive documentation. The third tenet is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And number four, it's responding to change over following a plan. So really those are the sort of the core tenets of, of agile in general, right? So if you can stick to that sort of like philosophy and work from there and you know, the tools and, and the ways of doing things are just tactical. But if you can really stick to those things, which are very difficult, I think, for traditional business and traditional corporate leaders to do because it's such a cataclysmic change for them, um, you'll be good <laughs> as a team, you know? I mean, but a lot of it, it, it just really relates to personal safety right? And trust, right? So you have to feel open to be able to shake it up, question what what people are saying openly and be receptive to critique and and test and do a lot of experimentation, testing and iterating. 
Uh, we've seen this over and over in the early days with startups. I mean, Greg, at SF New Techs, all these guys are trying stuff. There used to be a, a saying called fail early, fail often. That used to be thrown out all the time. There was a fail conference and all kinds of stuff. And uh, essentially that was, you know, one of the mindsets too, to be open to that type of thing. You know, it's funny you say um, a mindset. I, I, I have this podcast with another guy in the Midwest and, and, and their mindset is totally different than ours here on the West Coast and, and, and maybe a spe specifically a San Francisco because failure seems to be really uh, adverse. They're adverse to failure a little bit more of course. than we are. Yeah. Here we kind of almost laugh at it uh, sarcastically almost, mm -hmm. right? Like where we go back into that fail off and fail quick, you know, mm -hmm. uh, iterate. And I, I just was kind of, uh, I, I don't know, this whole thing about monitoring your employees, it goes back to what you said earlier is this trust thing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you don't trust your teams and how employees, how are you really going to, what kind of company do you really have at the end of the day? Right, and it hurts productivity when you when you don't trust employees. You do all these ridiculous things like constant check-ins, or, or these you know in various type of ways, whether it's Slack or email, and then it causes all these um, interruptions of your work, you know, your deep work or whatever. And then you get through these back and forth email threads or instant message type of situations or whatever, and it just eats up productivity, and, and that hurts your bottom line. That hurts your deliverable. It's just it's bad business. Yeah, no, I agree. So anyway. I, I kind of wanted to just talk about that as a follow up from last week, and you know, and we we can move on now. We can, move <laughs> on. We can drop that now. All okay, right, guys, do not monitor your employees. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. What's this about uh, VR Zoom? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I believe this one was from uh, C. Now I'll check later. But the the gentleman, this is coming from his perspective. Uh, I spent an hour and a half in a meeting last week. I wasn't on my computer or on my phone or my iPad. In a comfy virtual office space with windows overlooking a landscape that wasn't real. I met up with several people from ARVR, virtual conferencing software company, Spatial. I've met with Spatial before in the real world, trying on AR and VR headsets to explore the promise of how immersive tech could help us maybe take our offices with us. The company's previous business focused tools have now become free just as coronavirus has shut down endless offices. Its app is now available on the relatively affordable and standalone Oculus Quest VR headset, with, uh, which is what he's using it on. The last time I met with Spatial just a few months ago, I was thinking about a further off future of telecommuting, but now I'm entirely practically minded. I've been on more Zoom than I can possibly count. And while helpful, they've been, they, they have their limits. Spatial's approach, approach to virtual meeting rooms is like a VR Zoom blend. Uh, we are to be clear cartoonish avatars by necessity with a photo of my face stretched weirdly over a 3D model. It looks creepy. My face kind of animates when I speak. My hands move when I move the Quest VR controllers. In the room, 3D objects appear that any of us can grab and drag around. I Google up some models from Google 3D's object repository, Google Poly, and drag in a dinosaur and dragon. I pull my hands apart to make the dinosaur become huge and drop it in a sample 3D city map where we're standing around. Spatial works with web searches and also Microsoft and Google Office environments. Office 365, G Suite, and eventually Google Drive and Slack. So documents and spreadsheets and other stuff can be pulled up and shown on big virtual wall screens. Spatial's demo brings up sample briefing style rooms where art sketches are laid out on the walls and 3D backpack samples float before us for me to pick up, zoom in on or pick up and discuss. Participants can join Spatial's rooms through VR or a web app on PCs, phones and tablets like Zoom. What's really crazy is that anyone who's joining with a webcam can appear in a video window floating for all of us to see. Someone from Spatial's PR team is doing this. She's, she sees us as little 3D things in a virtual room. The weird feel of us meeting in a virtual fish tank with real people able to peek in makes me think of a possible future where performers work in VR, while directors or creators observe in video panels able to provide more emotional nuance with their faces. VR isn't able to blend moving around and using real facial expressions yet. 
which makes VR theater performances feel more like dance and puppetry than real living talking faces. But this hybrid of VR and video chat feels like something new. You can watch the montage of his VR meeting in spatial or try it yourself. It's available for Oculus Quest, PC-based VR headsets, AR headsets like Microsoft HoloLens and Magic Leap, or on nearly any phone, tablet, or computer browser via Spatial's web app. Spatial is planning a more full-fledged standalone app that will support more 3D tools on non-VR devices in the future, and its software is set to run on future phone-connected VR AR headsets too. For now, Spatial feels like the Zoom for VR app I could put to use right now. It's not the only one. HTC Vive Sync is a new tool for collaboration in virtual spaces, and many more are clearly on the way. In the meantime, Spatial looks like a pretty good map for what's next. Whoa. Well, I was just looking at, at, at that, that kind of virtual uh, world they had. <laughs> it was pretty, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough story to sort of visualize, but we will add the video on the website, guys, so you can see uh, the spatial demo. It's, it's, it's super weird. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> know. Interesting. I, I thought that was really cool. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I think the spatial aspect, uh, you and I kind of have discussed this over time in doing some of these podcasts as we do on, on you know, you, YouTube live to now Zoom mm. is it, I think it also has some downside like you it was pointing out that like we, we have a hard time really looking at depth into like a regular meeting that we normally are in right so mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I, I know they've been spoofing a lot of Zoom things with like um, I don't know there's a lot of these Zoom hacks that are coming out I don't know if you've seen a lot of them now where like mm -hmm. they, 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 they would pretend that like uh, they're reconnecting and that you have the ability to put yeah. reconnecting on your, on your yeah, yeah yeah they, yeah yeah so you can drop I off almost added that enough. as a tip today almost <laughs> we have something like that coming in one of our stories but yeah, yeah I mean yeah. Uh, you, you, in Zoom calls if you have a, a team it's difficult you know you get the gallery view and oftentimes there's too many people for let's say a laptop size screen or even a phone screen right so then that you're off the screen you have to sort of swipe or or go to a different area to see it and then stand, let alone uh, sharing your screen or something, then you lose context with those people totally. So I can see where uh, this virtual standing in a room together where you can look around and look up at a virtual wall and see the presentation and see the other people um, as well is, is kind of a neat type of thing, but we'll see. You know, we've been talking about VR for years and it's never really caught on, you know, and- um, Except in the gaming committee. committee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this does seem like another attempt and it seems interesting. We'll see how it goes. I love it. I love it. All right. All right. Let's All right, move man, on. Where are we? Here we go. Oh, uh, ask a, it's the ask, ask Adolfo segment. I always ask like me. It. Yes, I like this. So uh, I always <laughs> I, I, I've incorporated this in our podcast where I'll, you know, I take one of those top seven, 10 best, whatever. So this is the 10 most important work skills to list in a resume. And I thought this would be a great one mm. to ask my friend Adolfo here today. So All anyway, right. thanks to uh, lifehack.org uh, for this. Uh, Jerry Diamond uh, wrote this. And uh, you know, it's again, the 10 most important work skills to list in a resume. So in this day and age, he says, when a computer algorithm is perhaps more likely to comb through your resume before it ever lands in front of a human's eyes, how does a person know what skills are must-haves? So the skills that will help push your resume to the top of the pack fall in two distinct categories, hard skills and soft skills. So mm -hmm. anyway, how do you list these? So I want to go through this with you, Adolfo, and uh, we'll take maybe your, your experience with your personal resume. You don't have to mm -hmm. list your resume in front of us, but you could at least reflect on your resume <laughs> and mm -hmm. yeah, say, I need to, yeah. Okay. So five soft skills, let's go through it. Problem solving. Do you list that on your resume? No. Oh, well, yes. Actually, I do. Okay. All right. Good. Mm -hmm. Organization, not, not how to organize, how to be organi organized in your thinking, your person, that type of thing. No. No. Oh, interesting. Okay. Active listening. So this is these are hard to actually list, right? So Yeah, no, I don't. You know, um, you but know, that's do you just say yeah. I'm I, I'm a great active listener. I don't know, you know. So I'm, I'm hmm. trying. I'm still trying to go through this myself on how I mm -hmm. would list this in a resume. Teamwork. Yes. I think mm -hmm. that's pretty much a, a, a adaptability. Yes. Agile thinking. Right. Yeah. I'm sure you have agile all over your resume. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hard skills. This is a little bit easier because, you know, it's kind of expected. Yeah. Uh, communication. Hmm. 
No. Uh, it's one mm. of those soft skills category, but they fall under this umbrella. They're saying, uh, they're saying like copywriting, graphic design, technical writers, uh, uh, digital storytelling, like you do on this uh, podcast. It falls mm -hmm. in this category. No, that's so interesting. That's interesting. That's, yeah. that's could be helpful. Yeah, that's yeah. something definitely should add. Uh, sales and marketing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not I, really my forte, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I think what they wanted to do is really say that um, if you're in like uh, data analytics, SEO, social media management, uh, yeah, probably one of the hard skills you probably have to list down. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, project management. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can see that with you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Technology. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, you know, you know, from Excel to Photoshop, right? Anyway, yeah. yeah. Uh, industry specific. This is interesting. Do you tailor your resume to industry specific things that that industry may be looking yes. for? Yes, of okay. course. Yeah, it's okay. imperative. You bet. Wow, you pass. You pass the test. I think. Just barely. Eight out of ten. Eight out I'm, of ten. I'm a. Eight I've always been a great C minus student. So there we go. <laughs> Skate through. Anyway, that's the Ask Adolfo segment for today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, speed round, speed round. Okay, so Hoogle. Hoogle is a standalone search engine, basically, that you can just run on your own particular machine. So get Google search results, but without the ads, JavaScript, AMP links, cookies, or IP address tracking, easily deployable in one click as a Docker app and customizable, customizable with a single config file. Quick and simple to implement as a primary search engine replacement or on both desktop and mobile. So uh, we will add the link to show you how to do this. this is on GitHub, uh, Ben Busby, Busby, Hoogle, who's the creator of Hoogle. So some of the features, if I can run through here, some of which I've already stated, no ad or sponsored content, no JavaScript, no cookies, no tracking linking to your personal IP address, no AMP links, no URL tracking tags, no referral header, post request search queries when possible, view images at full res without site redirect, currently mobile only, you get a dark mode, randomly generated user agent, easy to install and deploy, optional location-based searching, and optional no JavaScript mode also, you can run this on all kinds of things. If you are a Heroku user, which is free for some, uh, you can just deploy it, super easy. Uh, and it runs all kinds of things like a um, pip x, pip. You can do it on Docker, you can run it manually, all kinds of stuff. And there's some really cool um, screen grabs, which we will add to the website. Um, and it looks really slick. And it's basically your own sort of Google search engine that you're running locally. Very cool little thing. That's amazing. That's amazing. Speed round. Yes, I can. Yeah. Speed round. Speed round. <laughs> oh no. Okay, this is very nerdy, nerdy and geeky. But a new solar panel suck water from the air to cool themselves. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Cool. So anyway, um, as you guys know, probably a lot of you are considering solar or have solar already. That the efficiency of solar panels are probably around, you know. 15 to 17 percent, maybe you know, on a wide range for older solar panels, 10. On the newer range, probably 22.5. But they're very inefficient. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the conversion efficiency. So, and also with with heat and time, it reduces the efficiency. So True. that's the problem. So a lot of these solar panels are sold with like water cooling systems, stuff like that, which seems kind of odd to me, right? Because now you're training, you know, you now have to use a lot of water to now. Uh, get the efficiency that you need, right? And especially in drought infested areas like we've been in the Bay Area, that's usually not a really good way of doing it. So enter uh, a, a material scientist at La Zhong University of Science and Technology in Taiwan, I believe. So uh, Dick, you know, basically they, they've created this little gel that you could put inside these solar panels that have this like carbon nanotube technology, which uh, carbon nanotubes, I think, are also very efficient in, in, in heat transfer. So, so they basically have this gel that you could put in there. And what happens when the heat rises during the day, the, the gel releases water vapor, which then cools the solar panel. And then um, it recondenses back into liquid. And then it goes back into your uh, storage retainer at the end of the day. So it's kind of this closed loop system. So anyway, for you nerdy wow. and geeky guys, there you go. Carbon nanotubes, gel, yeah. and 
solar panel of cooling. All right, speed round, speed round. That's really important. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so Facebook, fa this story is uh, Facebook, kind of a downer story in a way, but good. Facebook must pay $52 million for 11,250 content moderators, mental health issues caused on the job. And um, this is from Jenny Jardin, Zenny Jardin, I have Boing Boing, uh, great writer. Um, current and former moderators will be paid at least a thousand bucks. The power of journalism right here. Never say that reporting can't change the world or help right wrongs because that's exactly what happened with the Verge's reporting on Facebook moderators who were traumatized and harmed in the course of doing their jobs. In a landmark acknowledgement of the toll that content moderation takes on its workforce, Facebook has agreed to pay 52 million to current and former moderators to compensate them for mental health issues developed on the job in a preliminary settlement filed on Friday in San Mateo Superior Courts. <coughs> Excuse me. The social network agreed. The social network agreed to pay damages to American moderators and provide more counseling to them while they work. This is huge. And it's based on reporting by The Verge in 2019, which showed that Facebook moderators hired through the staffing firm Cognizant were working in awful conditions in Phoenix, Arizona and in Tampa, Florida for an annual salary as low as $28,800. Moderators were placed in high stakes environments that demanded near perfect accuracy in, in navigating Facebook's ever changing content policies while being subjected to imagery that could sometimes begin to haunt their dreams within several weeks. Several moderators told The Verge that they had been diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, after working for Facebook. Later in the year, Cognizant announced that it would leave the content moderation business and shut down its sites earlier this year. Under the terms of the settlement, every moderator will receive $1,000 that can be spent however they like, but the companies intend for the money to be spent partially on medical treatment, covering the costs associated with seeking a diagnosis related to any mental health issues the monitoring the moderator may be suffering. The amount of money a moderator will receive beyond the initial 1,000 will depend on their diagnosis. Anyone who is diagnosed with a mental health condition is eligible for an additional 1,500 and people who receive multiple concurrent diagnoses, PTSD and depression, for example, could be eligible for up to $6,000. In addition to payment for treatment, moderators with a qualifying diagnosis will be eligible to submit evidence of other injuries they suffered for their time at Facebook and could receive up to $50,000 in damages. Facebook said in a statement on the settlement, we are grateful for the people who do this important work, blah, 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 you know. Uh, people need to realize that this is this is really nasty work. It's, it's very difficult, I don't know, you, you hear this money is a drop of the bucket for Facebook and for those people deserve a lot more. They're seeing horrible things. I mean, uh, cruelty to animals, children, you name it, the, everything you can imagine, it's just awful. And I, I feel for these people, um, I'm hoping that AI and, and I'm sure Facebook and every other company too is working on, um, better able to filtering these type of things without uh, having a human go through this type of uh, horribleness. Yeah. yeah, I had a friend that worked in that type of environment. In fact, a lot of, a lot of that works contract and they had to rotate mm -hmm. constantly in and out and have psychological training, all this stuff. So anyway, mm, good, nasty. good story. Speed round. All right, speed round. All right. <laughs> hey, our, our favorite topic, right? Uh, the, the a virtual maker fair is and how it was announced uh, 24 oh, yeah. global show and tell for makers featuring the the civic response to covid-19 happens on saturday may 23rd according to dale doherty the founder of the maker fair um, at the funny. Maker Fair on May 23rd, we will feature the important ways that makers have responded to the challenges brought by COVID-19. I have uh, called the Maker Response Plan C for civic response because the maker community is a model of a new kind of self-organizing civic response to a crisis, which we've talked about before on this podcast. So, um, and the Pacific uh, the rough response represents a way of to think by innovation and for the public. So it's very a uh, social entrepreneuring model that he's mm. really promoting. And so uh, they'll be applying the same organizing principles as they do to the regular um, uh, Maker Fair. The event will be organized by those who choose to participate, individuals and groups, and it's going to be on a global basis. This is really kind of cool. So over a 25 hour period starting in Asia, then heading to Europe, then ending in the Americas, the Virtual Maker Fair will showcase makers and their projects, and they can reach out to everyone where else, where they live, share the know-how and ethos of making. Isn't that so cool? Nice. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. so great news. Great Let's news. Let's be there. Let's be there, man. We'll cover it. Very cool. All right. All right. Tip time. Tip time. Tip time. Tip time. Tip time. 
Art Breeder. So go to artbreeder.com. Art Breeder aims to be the new type of creative tool that, empl that empowers users' creativity by making it easier to collaborate and explore. Originally GAN Breeder, it started as an experiment in using breeding and collaboration as methods of exploring high complexity spaces. Art Breeder is named after research of Pick Breeder, which investigated the role of exploration in the optimization process. It is also inspired by an earlier project, Facebook Graffiti, which demonstrated the creative capacity of crowds. So it's hard to describe, especially for you people listening. Uh, you'll, I would definitely recommend going to nerdstalker.com to see uh, what this thing can do. It's a web-based, basically you're, they provide several different types of images and you can mash them together. Uh, make images by mixing any art breeder images together, mix a Maltese dog with a bubble or anything you can imagine, and then show these really surreal, really beautiful, crazy uh, type of results that, uh, that result in this type of thing. That's so so cool. check it out. Go to artbreeder.com. It's a lot of fun to play with, web-based, and has all these settings fun for kids and yourself. So that means you can use it on any type of device, ideally bigger screen, iPad, something like that would be cool. Nice, nice. Oh, God, that's awesome. I'm going to try that out. Tip time. Tip time, tip time. Tip okay, time. let's move over to <laughs> Thanks to All Life Hacker, which I follow religiously, Emily Long um, at Emily and DC. Dictate your messages using this Mac keyboard shortcut. And I, I've never really kind of thought about this, but yeah, I'm going to show you guys this. Uh, you know, we're going to embed this, but, but basically using the function key. Um, on your Mac keyboard, if you tap it twice, it'll actually have a key, uh, a microphone that'll actually come up in the right-hand uh, part of your screen, and yeah. now you could go to dictate. And so um, I'm going to I'm going to demonstrate that to you using I love Adolfo, I love Adolfo, I love Adolfo. <laughs> 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 anyway, that's my tip. Uh, really kind of cool. It's usually you know it's part of that accessibility option in your in your preferences on your Apple. But um, it's very useful. I've, I've it's it's actually using. fantastic, man. I've used it quite a bit in the past, and it's gotten better and better. I would say it's almost on par with Dragon Dictate, which was mm. a and is a very expensive piece of software. Yes. I actually prefer the dictation of the native Apple OS uh, dictation services now. Um, it is so good, and they've just it, it keeps getting better and better and better. And the more you use it, it learns. So yeah, yeah this is a great tip. I mean, on gloves, uh, well. This is on the keyboard, but I use I use Dictate now on when I'm using my gloves and now I'm out using my phone, so I, I got very cool. Depend on that. All right, tip time, tip time, one more. Tip time. So this one also from Lifehacker, how to create a looping video of yourself for your virtual <laughs> meetings by uh, Brendan Hess. So as we mentioned earlier about uh, making it seem as if you're having troubles connecting, what Greg mentioned, there's a little trick to do that. You can check that on Lifehacker, I believe, as well. Uh, depending on how creative you're feeling, virtual backgrounds can make video calls a lot more fun, but they also have a strong potential to be used for evil. Case in point, in Zoom, you can make a virtual background from most any image file or video file. That means you can use the feature to display a looping video of yourself. Perfect for those times that you're supposed to be in a meeting, but really don't want to be in a meeting. It's a handy little trick for the physical distancing area. And best of all, you don't have to be a tech wizard to whip it up in the virtual background in Zoom. All you need is a webcam, some free editing software like Windows Movie Maker or iMovie, and a computer good enough with specs that it can load Zoom virtual backgrounds, oh, and Zoom, of course. And so it gives you all these different steps. Uh, part one, recording your video. You can do that in Zoom as we're doing now for this particular podcast or video, depending on if you're watching it or not. Uh, trimming your footage, you can do that in your, you know, you can export your video from Zoom and edit it obviously in your, in your video editor of choice. And then part three, you create a virtual background. So you open Zoom again, you click the gear shaped settings icon, go to virtual background and hit the plus add video, select the add video, find and open your video you recorded and trimmed in the steps above. This will now be your webcam background while you're in meetings. However, if you're trying to use your background to fool people into thinking you're on camera when you're not, you'll need to cover up your webcam with tape or paper so that nothing else shows on top of your looping footage. It would look a bit suspicious for you, a superimposed you on top of the looping video of you. If done properly, this should be entirely convenient convincing, provided no one tries to talk to you mid-call. Just watch out for the glitches in the matrix, lest people start paying too much attention to your cat wandering by in the background. Tip time. 
with you, I will just use my nodding. <laughs> the old nodding trick. Anyway, all right. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching another episode of Nerdstalker. Uh, check us out at nerdstalker.com. I am Adolfo Veranda at Nerdstalker on Twitter, nerdstalker.com, YouTube, uh, forward slash Nerdstalker TV. All the places, please subscribe, thumbs up, hit the bell on YouTube, uh, give us a nice rating. And Greg, where can we get a hold of you and get more information? Oh, uh, I'm on uh, Twitter uh, religiously at, at Social Greg. And uh, you could just contact me uh, at Social Greg at nerdstalker.com if you want to email me directly uh, with a story, a tip, or just to say hello. Thank you. Awesome. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening and watching out there. All right. Be careful out there. <laughs>